Hello, I'm Manoj Kalmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. I trust you are well wherever you are in this wonderful world. In this next presentation, I'm going to share with you some videos on how you perform central neuraxial blocks and paravertebral injections in patients with difficult spine, particularly scoliosis, instrumented backs, ankylosing spondylitis, to name a few. If you like any of our videos, do remember to like and share these videos with your friend. If you are new to our channel, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notifications of any future uploads. Now enjoy the upcoming video. Okay, so this is um, basically to try and um, put all this uh, into perspective of patients, into clinical care, how we can uh, apply this in our, in our clinical practice. So again, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, one last time, I got to tell you again that using complementary imaging in these difficult patients uh, as part of your planning uh, of these procedures is very important. Uh, just the other week, uh, I was one of the consultants uh, referred about a patient presenting for total knee arthroplasty. The patient had, had uh, one side where they had a very difficult spinal. Uh, patient was a known um, ankylosing spondylitic patient. My question to my uh, junior colleague was, does the patient have a CT? Uh, so they looked around in the PAC system in our, uh, in our medical care um, database. They found no recent CT. So I said, we are not going to do this patient until we get a CT done. So the, you could see here that how, how much importance I pay to uh, evaluating the spines before I touch them. <clears throat> so do pay attention. It can come or go a long way in helping you to plan your approach. So this is an individual with thoracal lumbar scoliosis, and I showed you this picture uh, in before. Uh, this is the same patient, but I'm going to show you a, a few more images in this case. So the patient is in the right lateral position, and although I'm a right-handed individual, now I'm forced to use my left hand. But for some um, reason, uh, the patient would not want to lie on the left side. So Although the, the uh, pathology, the broken leg hip was on the, on the dependent side, as you can see, she was quite used to that and she did not mind. So this is a, a preliminary scan. You can see that there is some rotation of the vertebra. It is a clockwise rotation here. You can see this element is much higher and this would be where the midline is in this case. So we palpated the spines uh, or ultrasound the spinous processes and created this spinous process line, <clears throat> and then performed the sagittal scan relative to this. Remember now, in most um, elderly individual, because of loss of vertebral um, height, because of the loss of the intervertebral disc height, uh, the, there is often a winging of, this, of the um, ilia crest, if you may. It goes quite high. So the space also becomes quite less. This can, uh, this can also uh, hinder with sometimes probe placement in, in, in this non-dependent side. As you can see, the chest is probably, the uh, chest wall is probably somewhere around here. Uh, it's a paramedian, it's a sagittal, it's an oblique scan. We're using a C5 to one low frequency transducer, but you can see here, I can insonate almost everything like a normal spine. If I showed this to, to you, and I didn't show you the preceding pictures, you would think, oh, this is a normal spine. Um, spinal in this patient, huh, no big deal. Uh, you can uh, perform a paramedian spinal. Yes, once you achieve this image and you are able to um, take into consideration how to perform a sagittal oblique scan in these patients, then it, it's a very simple procedure. Uh, we use normal saline, no ultrasound gel is used. Forget about the spring-loaded syringe. Uh, and you see, we pay a lot of attention to this alcohol hibitin because um, if this were the same color, then someday you will make a mistake. And such accidents have happened, uh, was last reported in Australia. So uh, today it is all colored and I'm sure in most centers is the same. But the thing is, uh, when you apply a gauze to the saline and you apply it on the back, uh, I often say that that gauze should go to the bin. It should not return to this galley pot here. 
because it's conceivable that you may translocate some common soil organisms that are in the skin now onto the gallipot and then onto the spinal canal or into the epidural space. So you must develop a, a, a protocol in your hospital where if you're going to use saline, then this saline must be used uh, carefully because simple um, uh, steps that you may think is innocuous may be, uh, may be adding more risk to the patient. Uh, and if you did not use ultrasound, then this would not be an issue. So here we are uh, performing uh, local infiltration. Uh, the introducer needle is introduced, and then the 25-gauge spinal needle is used. Now, uh, we often used uh, fine needles. Uh, if they are difficult with the spine needle, that's only when we go to pencil point 22-gauge needles. But 22-gauge um, pencil point needle is not our first choice. We use 25-gauge, and if we find that it's not conceivably possible or difficult, then we use it. You can see here the needle has been advanced in plane into the interlamellar space. And uh, <clears throat> CSF reflux was slow, as you will see here, uh, as anticipated. So we are aware that, now this is after a minute, okay? Or so, you can see here, there's no CSF reflux. Now, I think uh, if uh, we were not aware of it, you would be poking day and night uh, and maybe make a big hole in the dura, but you will never get CSF uh, in some cases. And I mentioned uh, why this may be the case. So I think it's quite safe to, although I never used to do this procedure, but the more I, I do these uh, interventions, now I, I am more willing to perform a gentle aspiration till you get some CSF that you can see. Uh, and then I inject the local anesthetic. In fact, in our paper, we also wrote that without CSF reflux, um, we injected local anesthetic because we could see that the needle tip within the thecal sac. Uh, and all these patients that we performed during in that series had successful spinal anesthesia. So therefore, uh, dry taps may be more common. So now this is another case where there was a failed landmark-based spinal tap, uh, and they didn't know what the underlying anatomy was like. You can see here, there is a, 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 a tilt of the spinous process. Uh, and the, uh, the imaging is not as pitchy as you would normally think I showed you. But this is a transverse scan we are doing over the sacrum, and you can see the L5-S1 space is still visible. You will see this is the median sacral crest in the transverse view, and then the thecal sac and the anterior complex. So um, we did uh, a successful spinal injection in these patients. Also, uh, uh, the L5-S1 is insonated in the sagittal view. And you can see that in the L3, 4, and 5, there are no acoustic windows, in fact. <clears throat> it's only the L5-S1 <clears throat> where you can see the neuraxis. Now, this is what I alluded to before. God is great. He's left this space open for us so that the patient can have a spinal through this. But sometimes you may also see as you go upwards, uh, you can see some uh, open uh, windows but again, because this was a spinal for a, for a lower extremity surgery, we elected to inject it at the L5-S1. <clears throat> okay, so this is a <clears throat> lumbar scoliosis. And again, uh, this is uh, the image. You can see there's a rotation in the vertebra now in the anti-clockwise direction. The interlamellar window is, uh, interspinous window is seen here. Although the articular process is high here with the anti-clockwise rotation, you can see the spinal canal. If you had the dexterity of advancing the needle through this interlamellar space, then the transverse in-plane approach would be quite satisfactory in this case. You can also see we've done the uh, sagittal scan. The L5-S1 is once again visible, although the other elements are pretty much not available. Um, this is, uh, again, uh, some mild scoliosis here, you can see. Um, the, this patient had difficulty with the landmark technique, but once we put the probe in uh, and we perform the scan, you can see the interspinous window is very clearly visible with a very clear posterior dura. So I think uh, this spinal is quite simple, a transverse in-plane dependent. So you can see the dependent needle entering the thecal sac here, and the spinal injection was performed with no difficulty. Uh, ankylosing spondylitis is uh, another Problem that you will often see, this is what produces the typical bamboo spine as it described, where the inflammatory process 
calcification of the anterior posterior ligaments and the laminar and the paralaminar structures often shuts down your access to the um, to the uh, central uh, canal. Uh, this is these are images we rendered of the CT that of from this patient. Uh, you can see here is a typical uh, CT. Uh, this is a coronal view. This is a sagittal view. You can the spinal canal and most of these are ossified. You can see the posterior uh, and the interlaminal areas. And in the this posterior view, you can see. Uh, we then looked at the sagittal view of the lower part here. You can see. Voila. God left this open for us again. So L5S1. So L5S1 can be a very useful site for performing uh, neuraxial blocks uh, in these difficult patients. So, so don't shy away from this. And you can see here, the 3D CT rendered image, you can see the L5S1 space is indeed open. It's more open on the right than on the left side here. So uh, you can even know that, oh, I need to do the spinal through this way, this side, rather than if the patient were lateral, then this would be a non-dependent side and on the dependent side. So I think these were the images that we acquired uh, in this patient. You can see that the entire paramedian window is closed. You can see nothing uh, through the interlamellar spaces uh, except at the L5-S1. If anybody knows why the L5-S1 is always open, not that I'm complaining, but if uh, somebody knows a good scientific reason, I would like to know about it because this is often the stairway to where I want to be. So uh, often it, it is good for the patient because we can now deliver uh, spinals uh, to these difficult cases with ease. Uh, this is just to show you again that uh, in plain needle insertion is quite simple. Uh, you insert it. Remember, paresthesia would be more common. Uh, so don't wiggle and jiggle the needle inside. Uh, CSF uh, efflux will also be relatively slow, so um, gentle aspiration is, is, can be uh, useful. So this is a patient uh, I remember almost eight, ten years ago. This was a, maybe not this one, the one after this. This was a case where there was a failed and abandoned spinal. Uh, now, sometimes, as um, uh, Dr. Shia mentioned, just because you have the ultrasound in your hand doesn't mean you are a superman or you are superwoman or you are the champion here you must know you must uh, know uh, to be humble uh, there are times when you have to know when to admit defeat and these are the words that uh, <laughs> kenneth used and i like it you must admit defeat defeat um, as soon as you know that this is uh, not going to be uh, possible because like you see here as the image loops around you can see this is a paramedian sagittal view in an ankylosing spondylitic patient, uh, I just can't see any um, viable acoustic window through which I can reach the to the neuraxis, uh, and uh, therefore uh, we admitted failure. Uh, we admitted failure not only because the paramedian sagittal, but also the transverse view was not visible. This is a patient uh, with a post laminectomy history of the lumbar spine. As you can see, this is a paramedian sagittal view, ladies and gentlemen. This is the cranial end, this is the caudal end, the needle is inserted in plane. The only window I can see here is the, uh, I can't tell you which uh, window it is because none of the laminar, uh, the anatomy, spinous anatomy is here. There's a whole lot of ossification uh, in this area that is um, happens because of myositis and ossification, etc. So the only space we had was to the uh, L5S1. This was before the time we started evaluating um, CTs and MRIs. So um, I guess if today I were to see this patient, I would definitely look at the CT more closely before I stick my needle in there. Uh, this is another challenging case. <clears throat> I think this was the case I was referring to. Uh, this again highlights how uh, alternative imaging model modalities can aid in your provision of regional anesthesia in these difficult patients. Although you are able to perform the scan now, you're able to perform the intervention. The information that you can get from CT and MRI uh, and rendering this in the comfort of your office is, is exceptional. And you will find this uh, go a long way in achieving success in the minimum number of attempts. So uh, uh, it also tells you why the uh, spinal may have been um, 
Uh, you may have a failed spinal in this patient. I think this patient was also a case where um, they were unable to intubate him. So in the last attempt, they had a failed spinal, sorry. <clears throat> uh, they had a failed spinal, so they <clears throat> went on to give him a general anesthetic, and they found that uh, intubation was very difficult in this case. They eventually intubated him with a fiber optic, but it tells you that general anesthesia can also be quite difficult in these challenging cases. So uh, how would you proceed if you had a patient presenting for, say, a procedure in the gluteal area? I think it was a back sore uh, for skin, <coughs> skin grafting of a sacral wound. And so these patients are bedridden for long periods of time, and, uh, and they have sacral sores. Uh, so we had actually requested the high-resolution CT. This patient had had a, a previous spine surgery. Uh, and having had the data in, uh, in hand, uh, we um, looked at it. As you can see here, some of the posterior elements are, are missing, uh, and you can see some of them in the higher parts. But you can also see that there's a lot of ossification in the area where the uh, spinal canal is now located. There's also a lot of uh, ossification here, uh, obscuring um, your needle access to the thecal sac. The thecal sac shape has also changed, and you'll be amazed to see uh, what you can see in this bony window here, actually, you can see that the ossification is extended into the thecal sac. Uh, as you can see here, there's big um, masses of, uh, of bone uh, ossification, I guess post-operative uh, post ossification from a surgery. Uh, and this is uh, from callus formation, I suppose. Uh, but when you did the coronal scan, you can still see looking from behind, uh, we're going from the spinous process anteriorly, you can see that the spinal canal is still communicating in some parts, it's, uh, it's been obscured by these bony catheters. So what is your technique of choice? Given that there was so much um, ossification in the lumbar region, uh, uh, and there was a, was a very challenging patient with difficult airway, difficult spine, I elected to choose to do a caudal epidural in this case. We use ultrasound with nerve stimulation and successfully performed the epidural with 20 mils of local anesthetic, which provided perfectly good anesthesia for the gluteal and the perineal area and up to the, uh, to the, uh, to the upper lumbar region, to the lower lumbar regions, and was successfully performed. So sometimes you have to tailor your technique at the spur of the moment to try and achieve what you want. And you can see here, this is a patient's spine aseptic precaution. We are using nerve stimulation here too, because I wanted to make sure that uh, the needle uh, is surely in the epidural space. We are looking for um, uh, anal sphincter contraction. For those of you who have done caudal epidurals with, uh, with nerve stimulation, you will know this very well. You look for the um, anal sphincter contraction, you will see that. So uh, just to show you the relevant anatomy, a lot of this will be discussed in our next webinar in two weeks time, the sacral spine. So uh, when you do a transverse scan, this is what you will see, the sacral conua, uh, the posterior surface of the sacrum or the posterior table of the sacrum and the sacral coccygeal ligament. Uh, when you do a, this represents the sacral conua on your left in the CT, you can see uh, it's quite a wide area. So, uh, and you can very clearly identify them in the ultrasound. Uh, you can also do a sagittal scan to identify the posterior and the anterior aspects of it. And the sacral hiatus is, uh, you can see relative to the sacral coccygeal ligament and will appear like so. Uh, however, this, this anatomy may not always be uh, as peachy as it is in this image, but uh, in most cases, you have to do both the imaging to uh, determine where the sacro sacral hiatus is located. Uh, the needle is inserted in plane. Uh, now, this is a sagittal view that we are using. Uh, so this is the sacrococcygeal ligament. The needle is coming from the caudal aspect. You insert it, pass through the sacrococcygeal ligament into the, just below the uh, sacral hiatus. Because the acoustic window in adults, you're not going to see a whole lot much. But I like to show you uh, what I do in children. I think the same approach can be used for greater success in adults. In adults, it can be very challenging because the hiatus first is quite narrow. 
and uh, sometimes the in-plane, the sagittal view, although can give you a beautiful image to get the needle into the hiatus can be very challenging. So we use a biplanar approach. And this is what I do whenever I do caudal epidurals in children, and you may consider it. This is a transverse view in a eight to 10 month old baby. You can see here, you can see both the sacral cornua with the wonderful anatomy. In fact, you can even see the sacral fat with the, maybe the phylum terminal here. You can see the, the phylum terminally going through and the acoustic window is larger. But what uh, I would like to highlight to you is that we insert the needle out of plane. When you insert the needle out of plane, you can be exactly in the center between the two cornua. Now, while the cornua are very wide in this child, now imagine you have an intercornual distance, which is maybe a centimeter or even less, that this becomes more important to be able to guide it between the two cornua into the hiatus. And once you have gone through the ligament, turn it to the sagittal view, and then you can advance it into the caudal space. Uh, this biplanar approach can achieve 100% success every time, all the time. So if you are going to do it, a uh, caudal epidural, my advice to you is to do this biplanar approach where you do it in the transverse view first, insert the needle, turn it around to the sagittal view, and then adjust uh, the amount of needle insertion you have to do. Of course, uh, you can, in children, you can inject some saline to see the um, expansion of the epidural space, but this would, you would not have uh, the preview of this in adults because it'll be in the acoustic shadow. You can use some Doppler to detect any um, medley of colors uh, within the epidural space distal to the sacral corner because in this, what I often describe as the beak of the bird, this is, imagine this is a beak of the bird, you will see some um, flush of colors if you use color Doppler. Uh, finally, uh, this is the last one. Uh, this is going to paravertebral block in a patient with scoliosis. This is an elderly patient with uh, thoracolumbar scoliosis. She had an S-shaped scoliosis. Um, she had multiple comorbidities with uh, SLE, hypertension, deranged renal function. She had ischemic heart disease. And as a consequence, she also developed core pulmonale from the severe thoracolumbar scoliosis, S-shaped scoliosis that she had. She indeed had a right heart failure a couple of times before her admission. Uh, and this time she was admitted with the left breast cancer for elective modified radical mastectomy. So this was a surgery that she was going to have for her breast cancer. Uh, Echo showed that she was a New York Heart Association 3 with the moderate TR and a pulmonary artery pressure about 55 millimeters of mercury. So that is significant in a patient who is an elderly about 78 years old. So we, we decided to um, perform a multi-level paravertebral with a pectoral plexus block for surgical anesthesia. Now, uh, this pectoral plexus block, we will discuss more during our uh, webinar uh, that is designed specifically for this. So uh, for today, just take it that we are using this to block the pectoral nerves. So this is the patient. You can see she has a severe scoliosis uh, and... Uh, she presented to us. So first we performed an examination. We were aiming to perform uh, a T2, T4, and a T6 uh, paravertebral injection in this combined with a pectoral plexus block for the surgical anesthesia. The latter, because we have demonstrated that uh, multi-level paravertebral blocks on their own with sedation is inadequate as the sole anesthetic technique. We will discuss more about this uh, in that uh, webinar, eight or nine, I think so. Uh, eight, I suppose, uh, at a later date. So please go through the program and uh, if it interests you, do be there. So we find the SP line you can see here, and then you perform a place a transverse uh, line relative to this. And then you perform a, a transverse scan relative to this SP line. I mentioned to you the window that you want to achieve. It's either the transverse process view or the articular process view. Now, because this is on the concave side, there's a lot of rib crowding in this spaces. So um, although I prefer the trans, the articular process window, there's a saying that when, when you are a beggar, you can't be a chooser. So whatever window was available to me uh, in this patient, I, I was more than happy to use it. So 
uh, as you will see here, uh, this is the spinous process. This is your lamina. This is your transverse process. And this is the ligament, the internal like, um, ligament uh, membrane, internal intercostal membrane. Uh, and the parietal pleura, and this is the apex of the paravertebral space, which would be where Dr. Shibata uh, performed his injection. So this is the Shibata window, as I often say. You can see a needle has been inserted uh, in plane, uh, and it's been inserted to the apex of the paravertebral space. Uh, this is just to show you that you can normalize that uh, view by rocking the transducer. So this is what we did. And you can see now, actually the spinous process is right in the middle, and the lamina are, are in, the, in the same horizontal level. So aseptic precautions, the needle was inserted from a lateral to medial direction. Uh, and this is just to show you a zoomed up view. Uh, we performed T2, T4 and T6 uh, in plane, local infiltration, uh, needle insertion with an echogenic needle. This is what you have seen in the ultrasound window. The needle is inserted in plane to the acoustic window. And once the needle tip is there, we inject a bit of saline uh, and expand the space and deposit uh, eight, six, six to eight mils of local anesthetic of an appropriate con surgical concentration to achieve the anesthesia. You can see widening of the, uh, the paravertebral apex and the intercostal space here. Of course, we can't see spread medially. Uh, patient is then turned supine. Uh, we perform a transverse scan, identify the relevant anatomy. Uh, the injection is performed between the pectoral muscles and then deep to the pectoral muscle at the level of thoracoacromial artery. This two injection technique is done so that we can uh, block a majority of the neural components that make up the pectoral plexus. So the concluding remarks to you is that although the scoliosis and these other inflammatory uh, spine condition pose a challenge to you. If you have a sound understanding of the pathophysiology <clears throat> and uh, have the appropriate dexterity in performing these ultrasound guided intervention, then real time spinals uh, and epidurals are possible in the lumbar region. So with these few words, I hope you found this presentation interesting. Uh, and hope you will take away some messages home. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention.